It's intermission time on this Philharmonic program, and here is your music commentator, Jim Fassett, with his intermission guest, the British pianist, Harriet Cohen. In all the years I've known you, Harriet Cohen, there's one thing I never told you. Do you realize that it was you who first revealed to me the world of Bach? Oh, that's wonderful of you to say that. Now, this was many years before we knew each other, before we had met for the first time on your records and when you used to play in Boston. Oh, I'm so touched to hear that because, of course, uh, I did concentrate on him mostly, uh, Bach and the moderns, the yes, contemporary composers, yes. And then uh, a good 10 years later, you were playing Bach and Vivaldi and De Faya on CBS radio. Yes. And that's when I first met you. Yes. You Long played the Nights ago. in the Gardens of Spain. Do you remember that yes. performance of Defia? I think that was the last time I played with orchestra in America. It was the most wonderful experience because that piece, as you, I think, know, was very close to me. I was a great friend of Falia. And in fact, when I was a very young girl, he taught me how to play it. Frightfully amusing incident about that. Um, I was at the rehearsal of the first performance in London, in the world of this. And the old boy was playing it himself, you see. And I was asked, would I turn the pages? I suppose I was about 17. So I trotted up to the platform and turned the pages for him. And in the middle, they were having a break. And he said to me, well, how do you find it goes, you see? So I looked very severe and said to him, it's much too fast. <laughs> and, and it's much too loud. They're simply drowning you. And, you, and I don't think you ought, to, you ought to start very much slower. And I went on like that and I said, after all, it's a kind of guitar music, you see, and the whole orchestra and the conductor looked too horrified, you see. And Defia accepted and, the criticism well, he, of a 17-year-old girl. He sort of mumbled something to me and bent his head. I can't tell whether there was a grin or not on his face, but when it was over, he turned to me and said, would you like to give the next performance, young lady? <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. Well, you nearly did, didn't you? I did do it, yes. Uh, I gave the next performance at the Queen's Hall, but I wasn't satisfied, so I went over to Spain, to Granada, where he lived, in his lovely house, Carmen, and had lessons with him, and he was very characteristic. He where was the house? Was it on the in hill? In Granada. Yes, yes, on the hill near the Alhambra? Yes, that's right. And he, what he did was, without saying a word, before hearing me play, he took me to the caves, the Sacro, uh, Sacromonte, where the gypsies, the gypsies lived. He knew them very well, you see, especially when he got to know that wonderful young poet, Lorca. Yes, And because Lorca was a terrible great friend of the gypsies, you see. And um, so we went into their houses in the caves, which were very scrupulously kept. They were whitewashed and with copper pots and pans hanging down, and the gypsies sang and danced. And they used to bring him very strange melodies from the, from the hills, from the, uh, from the faraway gypsies that they'd... The, the families had kept. They used to find them for him, you know. Did you keep <laughs> up your acquaintance with the Yes, he, he was always a great friend of mine and entrusted many performances with me. And um, as a matter of fact, I turned the pages for him again uh, later when he was doing the ballet the Three Cornered Hat. No, it was before, I think, for Diaghilev. And uh, it was in the house of uh, Karsavina in London. And um, I turned the pages again, and I remember Picasso was prowling about, uh, sort of weeding in and out of the piano, uh, looking at Casarina from every angle at this rehearsal, you see, because he hadn't, he'd left her dress till the very last. And the contrast between the quiet, witty-looking, dry-looking, perhaps, Falia, very thin, and the ebullient, restless, excitable Picasso with his eyes roving all yeah. over the place it was marvellous, you see. And I got quite friendly with him, young as I was, and um, was rather cheekily told him I adored the pictures of Matisse, you see, <laughs> <laughs> and Derain, you see. He didn't mind. And he told me that he collected Matisse pictures. Did he? Yes. And um, I think I'm one of the few people that know that. I wonder if he's got lots and lots of Matisse's hoarded away. Harriet Cohen, did you also uh, become acquainted with the Agolef? At that time. Oh, yes, very well indeed. I used to see him uh, three or four times in a week, regularly. I met all his authors and painters. As a matter of fact, if I did bring the new French composers like 
on a girl, Mio Poulenc, Sati, to England and other countries, including America. It was through Diaghilev's influence. It was later that you became an acquaintance of Sibelius, or a friend of Sibelius, in Helsinki. Well, it was, no, as a matter of fact, it was, it's awfully funny how I began all my friendships when I was frightfully young, and they continued all through life. For instance, uh, I met Sibelius when I was in my teens also, about the time when I was doing the Knights and Gardens of Spain. And I met him in London, in a restaurant, as a matter of fact. A very famous critic was having supper with him after a concert and said, uh, beckoned me over and said, believe it or not, Jan, this girl can play your end saga from right through from memory, your orchestral work. Well, of course, in those days, he wasn't so well known at all. And uh, nobody knew his symphonies. Perhaps the second had given, was given one performance. So we went up to a little room with a small piano and sure enough, I played this tone poem through to him, and he had tears in his eyes. He was very pleased about it. And then I saw him a lot in Helsinki, and I got awfully friendly with him. I used to tease him a lot, see, and he liked that. Did you ever ask him about the uh, mysterious Eighth Symphony? Well, I think that the reason... I did once tease him a bit, but I think uh, the reason that he was so fond of me was because I didn't ask these awkward questions. Well, I did say when we'd been, we'd been sitting up having a wonderful time with some other composers, and I said to him, I don't believe there is an eighth symphony. It's absolutely all rot. You're just talking about it to get attention, you see. And everybody roared with laughter. <laughs> and he took a box of cigarettes without saying a word, emptied the packet, opened it up, and on the opened up the white part, the cardboard, you see, he drew five lines and another five lines and a great spreading chord. And he said, this is the first chord of my eighth symphony. And I've got it to this day, and I presume I've got the manuscript. I wonder. He was a marvellous man. He had a tremendous sense of humour. I mean, you could spend your whole day laughing with him. And uh, he used to say some quite... Uh, his manners, of course, were like a grandee. He was very noble-looking, wonderfully particular about his clothes. Quite a dandy, you see. And uh, he looked really like one of his own fir trees. He had such a wonderful carriage and poise, like a grandee of Spain. And um, well, he was so hospitable to me that yeah. one time I spent with but him. But he knew you quite I, well, didn't he? No, this oh. is, he never heard of me, and uh, but just you had a happy day with had him. Had a beautiful afternoon at Yavanpa. At Yavanpa. Near the lake, the at house on the hill. Ainola. Oh yes, Ainola. But uh, lake, the uh, house on the hill. Ainola. Oh yes, Ainola. But, it's named uh, after his wife. Yes, you know? his wife. Yes, I Who know. Who still lives there, by yes, the way. Yes, she does. But uh, mm. I understand he, he didn't particularly like to have musicians call on him. Well, he liked, what he liked very much was a few conductors and a lot of composers. He liked composers very much. He rather adored the English, the late English composer Arnold Banks. He felt he was nearest to him. And he liked them all very much. He loved Sir Thomas Beecham. The, a bond they had in common was they both said that they loved to play the radio absolutely fortissimo the whole time. <laughs> no pianos for them. They had it on full blast, you see. And I remember him saying, I can't stand musicians. They talk about nothing but money and jobs. I won't have one in the house, you see. Then I looked at him and said in a little piping voice, what about me? Me. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you are my daughter, Harriet. Harriet, do you nice recall, thing. speaking of Sir Arnold Bax, do you recall the uh, incident with Sir Arnold Bax and you and me in the BBC studios? This was in 1950, my first trip to England, and I wanted an interview with the great English composer, Sir Arnold Bax. And you, of course, uh, knowing him so well, introduced me to him and came to the studio. But he was very taciturn, didn't want to, didn't want to talk, didn't seem... Uh, interested in talking and you said jim uh get him started on uh the piece he wrote for then the then princess elizabeth now queen elizabeth oh yes. uh get him started on that and then he'll morning he'll, song morning song then yes. he'll branch out from there so i began the interview <laughs> sir arnold uh, uh how did you come to write this uh morning song for the princess elizabeth and he said uh dear me uh, I don't know. Uh, 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 I just wrote it, I suppose. <laughs> that was the end of the interview. <laughs> the rest of the interview was with you. Absolutely marvellous. That's a wonderful imitation of him. You know, 
It wasn't that he was so taciturn. He was terribly shy. Shy? Yes, he was. He used to giggle. With Sibelius, he wasn't so shy. And with Vaughan Williams. So when you get two shy Mm. people together, we didn't have much of an interview. (laughs) Awfully funny that. I remember it well. Well, He wasn't shy at uh, your house at Gloucester Place Muse. Oh, no, Vaughan had fun, yes. Great fun. (laughs) Constant Lambert came, I remember. And you must have introduced many uh, American musicians and composers to... to, uh, British British audiences. Audiences, yes, it's quite true. I did all of them. I mean, uh, when you say all, uh, as many as you can think of, like Aaron, Aaron Copeland and Sam Barber and Roy Harris and Roger Sessions, and I could go on for, forever, you know. There's so many good ones, Paul Creston and David Diamond. I could go on for, for a long time, and I did give all first performances many years ago, and they used to come and meet the English composers like that much lamented Constant Lambert, yes. who was so witty. Lambert and Willie Walton and uh, all the younger composers. Not Elgar, of course. He stayed in the country. I wonder if his book, Music Ho, is still right. It's yes, it is, book. tremendously. I should never forget when he made Aaron Copeland literally shriek with laughter once in my house very many years ago. He was trying to describe a rather sort of Frenchified work by an English composer, and he turned around and said, you know, rather sort of Lepromedid and Fawn Williams. Which <laughs> I think is a frightfully <laughs> funny joke. He really was a wonderful young Harriet man. Harriet Cohen. Oh, I may now say Dr. Cohen, may I know? You may. <laughs> Doctor of Music, honorary, of the National University of Ireland. And that pleasant episode happened last year when de Valera, the president of Ireland, conferred it on me, because he's also chancellor of the university. It's great thrill having your first doctorate, isn't it? Dr. Cohen, <laughs> not Dr. No, Harriet to you after all these years. You know what Bernard Shaw said? What? There's only one Harriet. Referring to? Me. <laughs> did he? <laughs> yes, he did. I think that's a very great Has honor. he been to Gloucester House Muse? Gloucester Place Muse. Gloucester oh, Place yes. Muse. We were very intimate friends since I was about 17. And, um... I mean, sometimes he could be a little bit, what's the word, um, sharp on you. He was very, uh, used to drive me to practice an awful lot. And he could be quite critical. But I think he was very fond of me, if I may say so. And even though I lost most of my possessions by bombing, I still got about 65 letters from him. He's frightfully funny. He was always making me shriek. Well, it was decades before you ever played that he was music critic, wasn't it? Oh, yes. I didn't know him in that time no, at all. I shall never forget um, once he wrote me an admonitory letter saying, uh, Harriet, I hear you're looking a perfect wreck from overwork. Why practice? Get a pianola. <laughs> and he was advice. always joking. You know, I taught him to foxtrot and we used to play duets <laughs> together. Did you? Yes. Harriet, you came to New York last uh, December, oh, didn't you? That's right, yes. For the um, Metropolis Awards? Yes. Of course, I had to be back the, the year judges. before. Yes, to, for the Metropolis Awards. That was the most exciting event. Tell me about them. Well, um, it's very, very hard work, because you find that even with the young pianists who perhaps you feel aren't up to it, and then you don't see how they can pass because others have been so much better. You find yourself so concentrated. You listen so hard. Six or seven hours a day of hard, concentrated listening. It can be very hard. And didn't you have to listen to at least one piece played over by each contestant? Yes. In the first part, there was a piece of list, uh, which we got to hate so. It was called Fur Foley. Yeah. We decided we were going to use it as a swear word and would sort of say, <laughs> Fully to you, <laughs> something really rude. What about Prokofiev? I thought oh, that, that was, was lovely. That the Prokofiev Third Concerto was used as the obligatory piece. You see, so the I'm Metropolis Awards are not the only awards on which you serve as judge. No, I've been twice to Brussels for the Queen of Belgium. Very interesting thing, that the uh, last year, the Queen's last piano prizes, and among them were two winners, and gave us and Armada, both simply marvellous American pianists, and they both got prizes. And both these boys, last year, won prizes in my own international awards. The Harriet which, Cohen Award. Yes, of which Pablo Casals, as you know, is the patron, and uh, Kodai, the president. It was rather nice to know that these wonderful boys, I really 
I must say, I think America's got the finest young pianist in the world. Do today. you think so? I definitely think so. Well, you I know that because you have yes, an opportunity I do. to hear all of them, don't and you? I'm, I mean, Anievis and Amada and dozens of others, Shapiro, Lowenthal, there are dozens of them. De Bonaventura, they're all wonderful boys. I'm very proud to, to have given them awards. Harry Cohen, I wish we had uh, three quarters of an hour more instead of only a quarter of an hour in all, because this <laughs> certainly could go on very well, well very you, easily. You make for 45 me talk, you know, you draw it out of me. No, it's delightful, and I'm very, very grateful to you. I'm so happy to be here again in this dear place. And next time, please come again. Thank you very much. Jim Fassett's guest during this Philharmonic intermission was the British pianist Harriet Cohen.